The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, the next 50 years of computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047 and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. Our speaker. He's asked me to be particularly brief, so I will be. In 1934, the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge. 1937, founded the world's first computer science department. 1946, was in the Moore School in Philadelphia just after ENIAC appeared. Built EDSAC in 49, wrote the first book on computer programming in 51, the first paper on cache memories in 64, the pioneering client server Cambridge model distributed system in 1980, worked for DEC in Massachusetts and Olivetti in, and Oracle in Cambridge. Fellow of the Royal Society, publications galore, most particularly memoirs of a computer pioneer. Please welcome computer pioneer Maurice Wilkes. Thank you, James. Historians uh, sometimes engage in what has become known as counterfactual history. Uh, for example, they might assume that Napoleon won the Battle of Waterloo and start working out what would have happened. Eventually, of course, they'll come up against a check. Another battle is obviously going to take place, and they've no idea uh, what way it would, the, it would go. Well, now, predicting the future is very like counterfactual history. If you know what is going on in the computer industry, then you can make projections into the future, but not very far. You are limited by the impossibility of knowing what original inventions will come along. For example, in the late 1960s, it might well have appeared to any thoughtful person who noted the growing importance of local interconnection of computers and peripherals that something better than the offerings of the telephone company were needed. Uh, he might even have had the insight to see that an improved system would perhaps be based on computer techniques rather than on telecommunication techniques. But he could hardly have foreseen the Ethernet coming when it did. It was a unique and original invention. Uh, due to our conference cha chairman, Bob Metcalf, and his uh, colleagues at Xerox Park. And this might be the moment to uh, uh, congratulate him on a recent uh, 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 distinction he has obtained, that is, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Now, uh, major constraints are placed on what can happen by the laws of nature. As a young man, I came under the influence of G.C. Darwin, 
who was a very eminent mathematical physicist of the period. He was a grandson of the uh, Charles Darwin of um, evolutionary fame, and he was an interesting person in many ways. Darwin, my Darwin, became interested in population statistics. And he liked to observe that if the population continued to increase at its current rate, uh, which was um, about 50,000 a day, it's more now, then by AD 3000, there would be room on the earth for people to stand up, but not for them to lie down. Of course, something would have happened, some catastrophe or epidemic or something, or people might have passed some sensible laws uh, saying that everybody reaching the age of, what shall I say in this audience, reaching the age of 60 uh, would perhaps be painlessly put down. <laughs> I thought that the program committee was straining our efforts, straining our imagination somewhat to ask us to look 50 years ahead. Darwin was more venture venturesome. He wrote a book entitled The Next Million Years. <laughs> he, he was not, of course, trying to predict the future. He was trying to say something about what the world would be like, what the pressures and constraints would be. Now, uh, it so happens that at this moment, the laws of physics are about to impose a serious restraint on the, developments of, on the development of silicon chips. Something that won't happen in a million years, but will happen in the next couple of decades. And you've already heard about this uh, from another speaker. Since 1954, the raw speed of computers, as measured by the time taken to do an addition, increased by a factor of 10,000. Uh, that means that an algorithm that once took 10 minutes to perform, you can now do 15 times a second. Um, students sometimes uh, uh, want to get rich and they uh, ask for my advice about how to do it. Uh, the best advice I can give them is to dig up some old algorithm that once took forever, program it for a modern workstation, form a startup to market it, and then get rich. <laughs> now, we're used to the doubling of speed every two years by shrinkage, making the transistor smaller. But this, of course, cannot go on forever. Uh, Every time, other things being equal, you shrink by a factor of two, the number of electrons available to represent a one is reduced by a factor of four. And clearly, this must eventually lead to a shortage of electrons. <laughs> Obviously, you couldn't get below one electron. But uh, in practice, we will get stuck at something more than that. I don't know, hundreds, I'm not quite sure. Um, when statistical fluctuations uh, will make themselves felt and CMOS will no longer work if you try to go any smaller, or if it does work, it won't be any faster. This is the CMOS endpoint, and we will meet it early next century. CMOS, and, and it will be the end of the road for CMOS and semiconductor processes generally. Unfortunately, there is nothing standing in the wings ready to take over. Uh, tunneling devices have been disappointing. We've no idea how to build a purely optical computer. And if we had, it's extremely unlikely that it would be any faster even than the workstations that we have today. So that unless something entirely unexpected happens, we must look forward to a period in which circuits will not get much faster. Uh, no doubt there will be useful advances, but an end to the exponential doubling every two years or slightly uh, less. Uh, many people think that the future lies with single electron phenomena, uh, in which one electron more or less 
could make the difference between a zero and a one. Such effects have been demonstrated, notably in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, but only just, they've only just been demonstrated. Very early stage. No devices are even remotely in sight. And this is a development which may well take the whole of the 50 years which we are allowed today. Uh, there is, however, one, uh, one uh, qualification, one thing can, one can remark on, that a very painful gap exists at the moment between memory speed and processor speed. And that is getting worse, not better. There is, I think, no fundamental physical reason why a memory as large as a large DRAM memory uh, couldn't be uh, built with the speed of a cache. One would then have a one-level physical memory instead of a main memory and a cache memory. Uh, I wouldn't make any specific predictions, uh, but I consider it quite possible that there will be a major, a major breakthrough in uh, memory systems. Uh, perhaps it, one might hope that it will come just at the point uh, when we meet the CMOS endpoint. Uh, there are other possibilities, architectural improvements. They are getting more difficult. All the wonderful devices for speeding up that were invented, invented for the old main, main, big main frames have now been incorporated onto chips and uh, architects are running out of ideas. Uh, parallelism it used to be said by many people that we merely had to change over to parallelism and all would go on as before. And in fact, I used to uh, attract a good deal of flack uh, by pointing out that it was not so simple as that. I think it's now generally appreciated that while some programs lend themselves to parallelism, others do not. And I think it's clear that we shall stick on the older type types of problem, but forge ahead in areas which have not been very prominent in the past. When things are scarce, they have to be shared. We once had one computer per company or per university, and users lined up for their turn. Later, time-sharing systems came in. Now, we do not need to share computer power unless we choose to do so, and everyone can have his own computer. The important thing is that it is entirely under his own control, no conflicts with other users. The, uh, the dramatic improvements in fiber technology that have been going on uh, have had a remark are beginning to have remarkable effects on long haul uh, communications. I think it possible that the time will come when these developments have a big effect on local area communications. Specifically, I expect that we will see more and more dedicated links used to interconnect computers, terminals, printers, etc., instead of local area networks. With the great advantage, the great advantage of a dedicated link is that it is possible to guarantee quality of service. If you have a shared link, then unless you uh, divide the capacity into, into slots and uh, give one to each user, then quality of service can only be defined statistically. And um, I have an image of uh, computers and servers in a central location connected by dedicated fibers to terminals and printers. You can, in fact, at the present time, uh, uh, purchase plug-compatible links, which enable you uh, to separate your terminal from your workstation by a substantial distance. Um, I have one of those. Um, it doesn't make any uh, difference to the feel or performance of the workstation. In fact, this uh, link was installed while I was away on a trip. When I came back, I carried on as usual, 
I did notice for a couple of days that the workstation was no longer in my office. It was somewhere else in the building. And then, of course, I realized that that was why the office was so nice and quiet. Um, uh, this is a thing that rather excites me. I perhaps oughtn't to be going on when, talk when I'm supposed to be talking about 50 years hence, but I will go on for a little time. Um, if, you with if you like to think of the terminals in a building, uh, uh, or the, uh, connected to workstations in the offices, the workstations being withdrawn to a central room um, with uh, fiber connection left, then, of course, the local area network doesn't disappear, it goes with the workstations. It becomes condensed into the central room. And then all sorts of interesting possibilities arise. Uh, you can perhaps make it cheaper. You can perhaps make it faster. Perhaps make it into a bus instead of an ordinary network. And in fact, you can begin to think of the economy of equipping a building, economy as a whole, of equipping a building with um, uh, computers, allowing for the cost of installing the, uh, the fibers, uh, the cost of the racking for packaging the uh, workstation cards, uh, and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, many ramifications and problems, of course. A question of mindset. I doubt if people are uh, willing yet to go back to the idea of a centralized system. Um, but uh, perhaps when they realize the enormous reliability compared with a LAN of uh, dedicated links, uh, they might think differently. I see no reason why the dedicated link shouldn't have a, re um, a reliability uh, of 100.0 recurring 1%. And uh, I don't think you do uh, recurring decimals in high school anymore, so you'll have to work out what a 100.0 recurring one is. Uh, now, um, uh, the other things I would like to see happen, um, something in particular, um, I happen to think that programming languages took a wrong turn at the beginning in the late 1950s. And I'd like to see this put right. It was a very great pity that Fortran and Algol gave rise to two opposed camps when there should have been cross-fertilization between them. Uh, they, the, the, there was much that those two groups could have done for each other and we would have had better languages much faster. What I particularly regret is that the people responsible for modern programming languages remained wedded to the Algol stack-oriented block structure. One of the reasons for the success of Fortran was that there was no block structure. Block structure makes it difficult to include machine code subroutines in a program. It inhibits progress in separate compilation and in the reuse of subroutines. And it imposes an unsuitable hierarchical protection model. I hope that we may look forward to a time now when properly handled objects will be the answer. Uh, objects are much talked about, not always understood. Uh, we need an, an evangelist uh, to, to s stress the important thing about them. Perhaps James would like to take on this task. The important thing is that objects can stand alone. They're, they have a clearly defined interface to the outside world. Any routine can communicate with an object if it observes the correct protocol, and objects can communicate with each other. They have no ordering, they have no pecking order. They're all on a level. And I think we are, as a result of the coming of object systems, uh, we are seeing renewed interest in the things I mentioned, particularly reuse of software. It's always puzzled me that people are so fascinated by hierarchies. 
they're fine in the right place. And it's a good idea for running an, arm, an army, for example, to have a hierarchical system. And indeed, for other control, uh, other control uh, uh, jobs. If you want uh, to see what can be done with a flat, non-hierarchical system, then you only have to look at the web. In 1991, I was at a, a press conference in Turin. Uh, this uh, press conference was held in the rooms of the Academy of Sciences, uh, which is a venerable institution. It was founded 200 years ago by no less a person than Laplace. Uh, sorry, Lagrange. And in the course of a distinguished history, that academy has acquired many books. And in the room in which we had this press conference, uh, a big room, the walls were lined from floor to ceiling with books. No wall service surface visible. And I was asked by a journalist who waved at these books, and he said, will all these books be replaced by the computer? And I had no hesitation in replying that if the book had been invented after the computer, it would have been acclaimed as a great advance. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that, that, that served very effectively of getting me off the hook with the journalist. <laughs> but at that time, uh, I uh, could not see that the c computer stood any chance of re uh, to any extent supplanting the book. But experience with the World Wide Web recently has changed my view. At any rate, as far as reference material is concerned. I am not thinking only of formal reference works, but uh, as, uh, back, back numbers of scientific journals, for example. And I now believe that a computer can very well become the principal means of accessing such, a, such material. There are, of course, financial problems to be faced, how to remunerate, re, uh, remunerate the author. Uh, but since the author of that type of work doesn't get paid very much anyway, that doesn't seem a great problem. <laughs> much la, uh, the, there's also the publisher. Well, his production costs would go down very much, um, and he would need to invest less capital so he wouldn't want very much to give him an adequate return. But uh, I should, I should uh, in compliment to my friends in the publishing world, say that uh, we do value their, what they do in persuading authors to set pen to paper. And then there's a the question of quality control. We need protection against homespun reference works, so-called, full of misinformation. I don't know whether this is really a problem. I think you've just got to realize that if it becomes easier to spread information, it becomes easier to spread, spread misinformation. And you've got to cope as best you can. As to computers um, replacing the ordinary uh, type of book, uh, I'm uh, less sure. Textbooks, I mean, school students' textbooks and novels. We are waiting uh, for um, a display. It can be held on the knee, rapid turning of pages. And I have seen some impressive demonstrations, the sort of thing we might get. Maybe it's coming. Uh, 50 years is a long time. Uh, people talk about the software crisis, and I'm glad they do because software is the means by which a computer does useful work. Uh, if there were no software problems, then computer progress, as far as applications are concerned, would be at an end. Uh, General Sherman, in his uh, memoirs of the Civil War, uh, writes about the sickening confusion he always found as he approached a battle from the rear. Well, getting results from a computer is a battle uh, of a different sort. 
but no doubt that software is in the very front line of that battle. We've made a great deal of uh, progress uh, in uh, software over the years, I think. Anyone who feels inclined to doubt that should note that the software systems that we regard as normal today are vast compared with the systems we had 20 years ago. Um, so, um, in that sense, I think we have made great progress, and, and, and I think we shall make, great, make a great deal more. I do, however, despair of operating systems. They desperately need simplifying and streamlining. They allow you to do things in all sorts of different ways, one of which would be enough. They, um, there's no, the designers seem to have no idea of a, the balance between uh, response time, which is all important, and uh, facilities provided, and so on. I do not myself confidently predict that operating systems will be any better 50 years hence. <laughs> Uh, let me, in conclusion, uh, share with you a story that's just now going round the computer laboratory in Cambridge, England. It turns on the word exiguous. Now, I don't know about Americans, but most Brits know the word, but they have a very haze, hazy idea, perhaps no idea at all, of what it means. It means, of course, scanty or meagre. Now, the story, which I don't, I don't vouch for its uh, historical accuracy, the story is that in the very early days of timesharing, there was a meeting to decide whether a new computer should have the vendor's batch operating system or a newfangled timesharing system from Cambridge University. And there was a very, ser very senior government official in the chair. And at the end, he summed, as senior government officials do, he summed up the discussion, saying that the university system appeared to offer many advantages. But he had one doubt, and that was, was the documentation adequate? This question was, was uh, referred to Roger, Roger Needham, who some, some of you may know, who had been responsible for the development of the system. And even in his young days, Roger Needham was very good in committees. He leaned back in his chair, radiated a sense of confidence and well-being, and said, I would say the documentation is exiguous. Oh, that's all right, said the chairman. We can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs>